and do a brief introduction. So I'm very excited to welcome Joe into the space, Joe Brewer. And Joe has a unique background in physics, math. This is his uh, little bit of his background, a unique background in physics, math, philosophy, atmospheric science, complexity research, and cognitive linguistics. Uh, more than a decade ago, he left the academy to trailblaze a path for other research practitioners to follow. And we have him here with us. And also we have um, Andrea translating and Orlando. <laughs> Thank you, Andrea. And Joe, I'll pass it over to you. Yeah, hi there. Um, I don't know if uh, Susan, Valerie, Brian, Mushik, if you guys would like to uh, to come and join us and be more friendly. And Bertus, it's nice to meet you. It looks like a comfortable blanket you got there. <laughs> um, yeah, so Dan asked me if I would come and talk with you all about bioregional learning centers and you know, connected to the Ecoversity Alliance and this movement of decolonization of education and, um, and then also connected to the regeneration of landscapes. And so what I thought would be like a good way to start is just to say that um, my own journey through education has been a journey of mostly creating what I felt I needed because the general structures weren't well set up for what's needed. And um, yeah, my friend Benji here is hanging on the sidelines because he wanted to check it out, but he might throw in a word or two. Um, and, and really the thing that, I, that I've seen that's been um, most potent is this disconnect between the systemic nature of our predicament in the world. I would say the, the interdependent web of problems and the complete inadequacy of our education systems to deal with it in any legitimate way. Um, and so for me, when I started learning about the idea of um, thinking at the scale of an entire landscape, of looking at something like a watershed or something like a mountain range or just a, a coherent ecotype, like where I live, I'm in Bodhichara, Colombia, where there, uh, here we have a unique ecosystem called the High Andes Tropical Dry Forest. And it's this blend of the way the mountains, um, well, they escape us all. I think my daughter is getting insects out of a carton <laughs> that she wants to play with. It's like, what's she doing? Um, where here we have this unique kind of blend of mountain ranges, um, a network of canyons and river systems, and they pretty well defined a local climate system, and then a unique kind of ecology. It's, a, it's a, an ecosystem unlike any other on Earth. So to be in a place like this and ask, what is needed to create holistic and systemic health in a landscape? that's unique like this? And the answer is, first of all, every landscape has its own unique features. And so the idea of having universal education, education that just applies to sort of nowhere and everywhere, is not gonna help us understand what to do in this specific place. And that's an insight that applies anywhere. Um, and so the, the, one of the things that really struck me about six or seven years ago, when I was first learning about ecoversities, was that universities are mostly this sort of artifact of modernity, this way of creating a globalized workforce where people can have universalized information, certifying them to work. Like if you're an engineer, you can be an engineer anywhere on earth. You know, like there's a sense of the information being decontextualized. And then when I learned about ecoversities, I was really struck by the way that an ecoversity makes sense because it's embedded in local culture and local ecology. And what I see as the idea of a bioregional learning center is to just take that, sort of like go down the rabbit hole and see how far it goes. And what it brings you to is this sense that every place is embedded within a, a nested structure of holistic systems. And those holistic systems include local culture and local ecology. And they also include the developmental history of how that place came to be the way that it is, the unique challenges of that place, the capacities of the people who are there and why they love to be there. What is their sense of identity and connection or their feeling of belonging to place? And that um, the idea for me of a bioregional learning center starts with this, this place-based unique context. Every place is its own place. But from there, 
you start to see things like, uh, well, what if we wanted to bring the best scientific research, something like, um, you know, computer models that are studying the hydrological flow of water through the weather system into the surface water of the river, rivers, into the groundwater of the aquifers and caves, or whatever kind of geology is in the place. Or how would you look at something like the ecological connectivity, the biodiversity that's in the place, and how it relates to the kind of economy that humans have in that place? That there starts to be this textured richness, this like, uh, you know, advanced knowledge, sort of like this is beyond the complexity of what universities do. This is beyond the complexity of our best scientific research. And then it also starts to feel like uh, it should come back and recover ancestral practices, the sustainable practices of indigenous peoples, the wisdom traditions that they held in these places and maybe they still hold if they weren't completely displaced or destroyed by colonialism. And so, um, so when I think about bioregional learning centers, I'm really holding this sort of nuanced and sophisticated awareness. Like, what, is it, what does it really mean to live in a place and live in service to the holistic health and well-being of the place? Which, you know, is this blend of many different kinds of knowledge. And, uh, and that's what I wanted to be able to talk with you all about today is, you know, what does it mean to, um, to look at all the educational activities and all the ways that learning is done wherever we are? You know, there might be um, like community supports, book clubs, uh, social services programs, elder care facilities, um, where places where children go to daycare and you know matchmaking between old people and kids in the local library, all kinds of activities that may be in a place. And yet they're fragmented, they're, um, they're decontextualized and there's no obvious way to see how they fit in with the holistic way that people should be living in that place. Like, what does it mean to belong if you're an outsider who just moved to a new, a new landscape or a new town? What does it mean to not belong? And then how does that relate to caring for that place? And so, um, you know, one of my big passions has always been to learn everything I can about the world around me and then see how it applies directly to whatever the problems or the challenges are that I see. And I feel like the way most people experience the world is sort of the other way around. They live in a world that's profoundly broken, that they can tell it's not serving them, that they don't know what to do about the challenges and the problems in the place they're in. They feel pretty disempowered by the structures of the society around them. That's sort of like the typical experience of our broken world. And um, when we live into the already existing holistic systems of the place we live, like the way that water flows through the atmosphere and into precipitation and into the ground and into rivers and from the rivers and into the flowing life, the, what's called the small water cycle, the, the cycling of water through plants and animals and local ecosystems, is that they're actually holistic and already integrated, even if the human world has broken them apart. Even if the human world has you know, put a highway right through that, um, that uh, forest or has paved over that river, um, whatever it may be, and then we can reconnect with those holistic integrative patterns by coming to know the history of the place where we are and how it came to be that way. So i um, got to say I'm a little disoriented just by that, the lack of people showing their faces on cameras because I don't really know who else here and who's not. Um, I'm just used to being in Zoom rooms where everyone's, um, everyone's showing up. So I'd love to invite anyone who feels comfortable to, to come and join us socially and show your face and let us see each other. We can have a conversation more easily that way. Um, and then I won't feel quite as much like just, you know, dropping ideas into an empty bucket and not knowing who's on the other side. Um, maybe one thing I wanna say uh, to invite our conversation to go a little bit more personal, which may bring more of us into the sphere. And thank you guys. Jonas, it's nice to see you. Um, and uh, and that's to say, uh, you know, maybe to ask a question, you could raise your hand like, um, have you ever felt like you don't belong wherever you lived? Have you ever lived in a place where you feel like you don't belong? Like, has anyone had that feeling? I've had that feeling almost everywhere I've lived. And then the exceptions, like I remember when I moved to Eugene, Oregon, and then later to Seattle, Washington, 
and I'd grown up in Missouri in a very different landscape. And I was like, why is it this landscape feels so familiar and so home-like, even though I'm not from here? And, um, and I started to see that there was something about big forest and mountains and you know, waterfalls that made me want to belong, even though it was a place that I wasn't from. And so there's something about uh, not feeling like I belonged where I grew up and then feeling like I might get to belong in some place that I chose. Like when I moved to the, to the Pacific Northwest of North America and I felt like maybe, maybe I'll be allowed to live here. Maybe the people will welcome me. Maybe I'll find community. And mostly um, that journey has been an exploration of, of rejection and a broken heart. Mostly it's not feeling like I belong and not feeling fully welcomed and fully included wherever I might go. And um, when I started to feel when I came to Colombia, like I'm not from South America. I've been in Colombia for three and a half years. And I came to Colombia and my Spanish wasn't even very good when I got here. So I had a really difficult time connecting to the local culture. And there was still something about this place that I felt like I, I wanted to belong and I just might be able to. And after about a year, I really started to feel like the land was welcoming me. And then as my language skills improved and I started to learn about the culture and people started getting to know me, I did start to feel like I was belonging. And now I'm here three and a half years embedded really deeply in cultural and ecological regeneration at the scale of the entire landscape. And we're in the process of creating a bioregional learning center, which means I'm continually learning about this place and the people and the history and the possible future. And, um, and the idea of a bioregional learning center for me has become a way of living in the landscape, a way of walking along the paths of the landscape a way of seeing the, the trees, like this landscape that I'm in now is about 80% endemic, which means eight out of 10 species exist nowhere else on earth. So in practical terms, what that means is you, if you arrive here, you won't recognize the plants. Like these trees, they're so strange. They're not like the trees where I grew up because the trees don't exist anywhere else. And then they only have local names and they have not done the baseline scientific research to catalog them. So you can't go and look up the names of the trees. What you have to do is go and talk to local people and ask them the, the, the name that they have for this tree and then try and figure out, is this tree toxic? Does it make fruit that you can eat? Is there some medicine made from the leaves or from the bark? Could it be used for making textiles like clothing and starting to just develop an understanding? Mm -hmm. And the intimacy of that experience, the intimacy of seeing trees that make you feel lost in the forest, like where the hell am I? I don't recognize any of this. To eventually feeling like you've made friends, like, oh, that's a tachuelo. Ah, okay, that's a cucharo. Okay, that tree right there, they call kuhi. And it looks like an acacia, like something I might've seen in the Serengeti, but it's not. And, you know, and starting to have this intimacy and um, starting to feel like there's something indigenous about it. And it doesn't matter, like the color of my skin. It doesn't matter where I was born. What matters is the, the feeling of the relationship. And this way of feeling the intimacy and the relationship brings with it the, the obligation to care for the other beings in the relationship. See, where I live now in Barichara, Colombia, it's a unique ecosystem. And like I said, eight out of 10 species exist nowhere else on earth. And 95% of the forest has been destroyed, which means we have no way of even knowing how much extinction has already occurred. We just don't know. We'll never know. And the indigenous culture here was almost entirely destroyed by genocide. 
and the remnants of it that remain are really difficult to put back together, which is true all over Latin America and in many places in the world. So to be in a place like this and try to regenerate it, to try to restore the health of living systems, which of course includes the humans, is a really, um, really delicate and challenging thing to do. And so um, I feel like I'd love to have a conversation with all of you and unpack this more and explore like, why is it that we don't have learning centers in places like Barichara, Colombia, where if an outsider like me arrives, how would I start to learn the trees? How would I learn the history of the culture? Who would teach me? There's not a place to learn it. Instead, it's everywhere and also nowhere. And so what would it mean to create a learning center like this? And to create it with such broken knowledge. So much of the knowledge is broken and lost. Mostly the, the way we build knowledge is by touching injuries and wounds and seeing what's still alive. Um, and so I'd love to have, start a conversation with you all about this. Like, how does this relate to your own experience of belonging or not belonging? How does it relate to the way that you learned about the place you live now? Or how ignorant you still are about the place you are now, where you don't even know how to begin, maybe? Um, how did you enter into this, this way of relating to the place where you are? Um, what would help you to, to learn and understand better? What has helped you? I'd love to just start a conversation and then we can guide this into um, different depths of the significance of this conversation topic, but I'd love to just open it up into a dialogue. So does anyone have a comment or a story or a question that they'd like to share? Yeah, Bertus, and then Mariana. Yeah, Bertus, and then Mariana. I, I sort of uh, really recognize what you what you uh, what you told just now about um, about the landscape and, and belonging. I, I'm I'm a Dutch person. I, I come from Holland originally and live in France now. So it's it's not as exotic as as Colombia, but it is a, a foreign landscape for me. Oh, no. oh, did we lose Bertus? Can you all still hear me? I think so. Yeah, he's frozen. Oh, bummer. I know. By the way, hi, Aline. It's nice to see you. I know. Um, you. While we're waiting for Bertus's connection to come back, Mariana, I'd love to hear from you. Oh, but I can't hear you for some reason. Right. Mm. You are. Yeah, you could try okay. maybe like z leave the Zoom and come back. Sometimes that does it. Or it could be in your audio settings. Mm. I was giving a webinar earlier today and the technology just crashed twice. So oh, no. I know. <laughs> I it's an issue for a lot of us. Right. It's good to have creative attempts at solving these tech challenges. No, yeah. but I wonder for Mariana. Mariana. Ahora? Ah, sí. Yeah, now we can hear you. Okay. Yes, please. Tengo un problema que en esta computadora solo puedo hablar o escuchar, no puedo hacer las dos cosas a la vez. Ah, tranquila, ¿Al tranquila. ¿Alguien puede traducirme al inglés? Yo puedo y también Andrea, creo. Ok, creo que dijiste que tú puedes hacerlo. Sí, yo puedo, yo puedo, sí. Ok. Eh, bueno, yo resueno mucho con todo lo que estás mmm, contando. Yo soy de Guadalajara, una gran ciudad en, en México, pero después me mudé, estuve ocho años viviendo en, en una sierra al norte, en la Sierra Tarahumara, en un lugar montañoso con bosques de pino. Y hace seis años me mudé otra vez a San Luis Potosí, que es un lugar con semidesierto. Eh, y aquí estoy tratando de iniciar un proyecto de un espacio de aprendizaje y lo que más me interesa es que esté como basado en, en el territorio local. 
pero yo no soy de aquí. <ríe> y, no, y ha sido muy difícil esto que tú decías, ¿quién me va a enseñar, eh, ¿quién me va a enseñar sobre los ecosistemas locales, sobre la cultura, sobre la historia? Yo misma estoy aprendiendo. Entonces, bueno, es, me parece muy interesante todo lo que estás platicando. Más que una historia que contar, tengo muchas preguntas sobre, <ríe> sobre cómo se hace esto. Pero el nombre de Centros Bioregionales de Aprendizaje me llamó mucho la atención y resueno muchísimo con lo que estás planteando. Muchas gracias. Bien. Gracias. Voy a transicionar rápido. Um, what Mar Mariana said that she grew up in Guadalajara, but then she's moved to several other places in Mexico at different times. And each time feeling this need to start learning from the beginning, like learning anew. And it's always been very difficult. And so she resonates very strongly with the story of searching for belonging and the importance of bioregional learning centers. And she really just wanted to express her, her enthusiasm for this idea and this perspective. And I'd love to just uh, respond briefly to her in Spanish. So Mariana, para contestarte un poco, es que no podemos hacerlo solo. Es muy importante que buscamos por la comunidad que tiene sentido y buscar juntos. Es muy, muy importante. So what I was saying to Mariana is it's really important to find the others who are also looking and to look together um, and to really find community in the search. It's just so important. Um, so gracias, Mariana. Are there any other uh, um, comments or questions or things that are resonating? And Veritas, I'm sorry we lost you. <laughs> You're back. <laughs> you returned. Yeah, mm. my internet connection is very, very faulty, so. I got kicked out, but yeah, it's it's still choppy a little bit. Hard to hear you. Um, You're welcome but, to put things in the chat or try and share if you feel. Yeah, free. yeah. If need be, you could always use the chat to share to share comments. I guess what I can do um, to just carry the conversation forward a little bit is to tell the story of of Donella Meadows. So Danella Meadows, or Dana Meadows, as she preferred to be called Dana, she was a computer scientist at MIT and was the lead author of a very important study called Limits to Growth that came out in 1972. And it was the first computer simulation of the global economy that was looking at the flow of resources and what would happen when we came, when we arrived at resource limits. And so the Limits to Growth study was one of the first scientific studies of planetary sustainability. After that study came out, it created a lot of interest and a lot of controversy. And for the next 10 years, from about 1972 until 1983, there were conferences and meetings at universities all around the world by a group that was called the Balaton Group. And Balaton is the name of a lake in Hungary, which was the first place and the last place of the meeting of these people. And the Balaton group was asking the question, how do we become sustainable at a planetary scale? So it was 10 years, some of the best thinkers and best educated people who are looking at sustainability in the early days of sustainability. At the end of those 10, 10 years, Dana Meadows wrote an essay, a short article, The article is called A Brief History of the Balaton Group, which means the title doesn't tell you anything about what the article is about. And what she shared was what they learned, all of these dialogues at different universities over 10 years. And what they found was that we cannot look for universal technological solutions. We need to create local capacity to develop the technologies and the institutions for each local place to create a sustainable economy. What we might say is a local living economy. And that in order to do this, each place would need to organize itself as a, as a bioregion. And to, um, yeah, that's it. I'll write it down. Brief history of the Bala Tong Group. So there it is in the chat. And so um, what, what they came out with was that there would also need to be a research center and a learning center for each place. That was the place that would gather all of the computer modeling and simulation, 
the data about ecosystems and landscapes, culture and economics, and that it would create a holistic perspective on the health and well being of that place so that the people living there could make decisions and they could manage the challenges of their place. So in 1983, Dana Meadows said that the best thinkers of sustainability for her generation, they said the only way to achieve planetary sustainability is to organize ourselves as local living economies embedded in our landscapes and to have a bioregional learning center in each place. So here we are 40 years later, and almost no one knows that this is what they found. And if you look at all the research between then and now, no better idea has been offered. What's happened is that between 1983 and today, several large scale landscape regeneration projects have been attempted and some of them have been successful. An example is the Los Plateau in China, more than 100,000 hectares of land converted from extreme desert to a vibrant and healthy um, agricultural center in China in less than 20 years. And other projects like it that show us it is possible to do this. But because most people are being told that the way to become sustainable is to reduce carbon dioxide emissions, to change our consumer purchase behaviors, replacing light bulbs in our house, changing from an internal combustion engine to an electric car, things like this. When what we actually need to do is become indigenous. And what I mean by that is we need to become people, humans, completely harmonious and integrated with landscapes at the scale of local landscapes, which is the way that all sustainable human cultures are organized. All, what I, what I like to say is this, it is not true that all indigenous cultures are sustainable, but it is true that all sustainable cultures that we know of are indigenous. So we can learn from these sustainable indigenous cultures and we will see the identity of the people is the territory or the landscape that they are from. Their relationships to the rest of nature are kinship or family relationships. The, you know, that is sister mountain, brother river, brother squirrel, and so on. The relationships are family and the relationships are sacred. They're sacred relationships. And the rituals and the ceremonies that they have continually reconnect their emotions and their identities to the place. And that is how they can care for their place many generations into the future. And what this tells us is that part of the work of bioregional learning centers is to create the indigenous culture at least cultures that function like indigenous cultures in every place on earth, or at least every place where humans are going to live. This change is so deep and so profound, so transformative, that the only way to talk about it is to talk about belonging, to talk about history, to talk about the very specific context of each place. And then from that foundation, create a way of living that is sustainable. This can involve trade and relationships with other landscapes that are also organized in this way. There can be federations of trade, but this change is so, so different that most humans alive today don't even know that this exists. They don't know what it means to live in place. And to make matters more difficult, all of the sustainable indigenous cultures that we know of existed during a unique geologic era 
called the Holocene. And the Holocene is now over. Which means that we don't know if those cultures would be sustainable today because of rapid climate change, because of very different ecological, um, I might say, the potential for what kind of ecosystem can exist is different now than it was before. And the pace of change is different than it has been for 14,000 years. And why this is important because now we can no longer have indigenous cultures that are at the scale of a territory. We also have to have a planetary perspective. We have to see the landscape as part of the planet. We have to bring the scientific knowledge of the earth together with the indigenous knowledge of how to live. Science is mostly blind about ethics and spirituality. And indigenous cultures are mostly blind about the deep functions of the, of the living universe as we understand it through science. They're not blind at all about the other ways of knowing. Just as one example, indigenous cultures did not know plate tectonics and they did not know the carbon cycle, but they might know how to create healthy soil. I would say most of them do. To bring together healthy soil with plate tectonics and the movements of continents or the circulation of water and energy in the world ocean the migration patterns of fish in the world ocean, the weathering patterns and the erosion patterns that provide the nutrients in the floodplains of major rivers as they flow out of mountains. And I would say, even if indigenous cultures did or do know this, our landscapes are so destroyed and degraded that we need to bring technical scientific knowledge together with the, the culture of guardianship and stewardship of indigenous practices to regenerate landscapes in the time that we have. This work of creating bioregional learning centers is to make it possible to do this, to make it possible to bring the scientific knowledge, the cultural and historical knowledge, the indigenous knowledge and the wisdom from each place to bring all of it together and learn how to create health and well being for that place. And that is the purpose of a bioregional learning center. Gracias, Andrea, for eso. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I hear like a really beautiful call towards like envisioning and creating, supporting the you know the beginnings hopefully most places have some beginning of this whether it's like a few people whether it's a school whether it's um you know like a larger collective that is thinking about these things um and yet yeah there's so much it can feel like there's this whole spectrum of possibilities and how do we tune in and support what's happening in our localities and find the others as a starting point as a way i see mm -hmm. his hand, so totally Jonathan. Um, I was asking myself, uh, you were talking about this uh, future indigenous and um, a huge part of the global population currently live in cities and cities are very disconnected from place. Um, I was wondering if you, uh, what play or what role do cities play or do cities have a role in this future, future indigenous? And if not, does this future indigenous have to, uh, can this only exist with a much smaller population size? Uh, something like that. Yeah, this is, these are very good questions. To answer the question, is it even possible for there to be cities in the future that are regenerative is a question that doesn't have an answer. We don't know if cities really can be sustainable. But the places that are most likely to have sustainable cities are places that already have a shape to the land. If you think of someplace like London or Paris 
where there has been there have been cities built on top of previous cities for thousands of years because of the rivers that are there and because of the precipitation patterns or the the food supply in the ocean that is nearby. And so there may be several places that can have cities, many less places than there are now. And the human population now is not sustainable, so the a sustainable level will be lower. But to ask what is the role of cities in creating this, I think that there are at least two ways to think about it, at least when we when we start the conversation. One is that there is a lot of knowledge and wealth and capacity in cities that can help us to protect and regenerate other landscapes. We can gather money from cities and buy land in the country and turn it into community land or protected land. You know, and we can do other actions like this where the wealth that is in the cities, whether it's money or knowledge, whatever kind of wealth can help to regenerate the rural or the, the countryside parts of the world. So that's one major function of cities. And another major function of cities is composting. Let's just talk about composting for a moment. Composting is, um, it's a managed activity, it's a management activity that imitates what living systems do. Living systems create life and then the organism dies. And when the organism dies, its body breaks down and the nutrients and the water become available for other life. That redistribution of nutrients and water are called senescence or decomposition. And compost is a process of decomposition. If we think of cities as compost, some things are very obvious. Maybe we need metal for making tools in the countryside and the city is empty because the population crashed. You could always go to the city and scavenge materials. You take metal and melt it and make tools. So I mean, in a literal way, you can compost the city. But there's also a metaphoric way, which is that people who are disconnected, as you said, they don't have a connection to land and they are participating in an extractive economy that is killing and destroying other ecosystems. That that energy when it's released can be released semantically, meaning it can be released as, as letting a story die and composting the story, composting the narrative. So if you live in a city and you work a corporate job and you pay your bills and participate in consumer culture, you can compost that identity by leaving the city or by staying in the city and connecting to place differently. And so there are many ways to explore composting of cities. There are many ways to explore it. But I think that these are the two most powerful functions of cities right now are to take the inequality of wealth between cities and the country and invest that wealth into landscapes. And then also to take the nutrients and the energy of cities when it is not serving life and decompose it, break it down and redistribute it into ways that are more healthy for bringing up. And then we'll find out if cities are part of the future or not. But we, we really can't know. I'd say anyone who claims to know is assuming the past will be like the future, and we don't really know. So um, I prefer to be skeptical and just to help plan for the worst. And if I'm wrong, I'm wrong in a good direction. You know, that uh, the survivability of cities is better than I thought. I prefer that situation more than that I thought cities could be sustainable and they couldn't, and I wasted time and put energy into the wrong approaches. So I think the biggest mistakes will be where we put our energy and attention because we have so little time. Mm -hmm. Joe, I'm curious, I know that you were recently on a, a traveling tour to visit lots of places and kind of to what's happening. And I wonder like what you noticed um, 
as you made that journey, um, both in terms of like, what's promising, what's happening, like, where's people's understanding of what needs to happen? And who do you feel is like, yeah, which pieces do you feel like are, are there and ready and which pieces like need more work, something along those lines if you want to speak into? Yeah, and are you still in, in Eugene or have you moved somewhere else? I'm in Colorado, actually, near Boulder. Oh, you're in Boulder, okay, I thought you were, okay, never mind, I misremembered. I'm going to be in Boulder soon. Okay, That's my partners okay. let's hang out. Um, he's going to ask us, <laughs> we're about to do a, a big bioregional activation in Cascadia in October, but in a couple of weeks, we're going to go down the Colorado River from the headwaters to the Sea of Cortez. Um, but I, I'd say one thing I found during our tour of the Great Lakes was people like Brian, who's on this call, is one of the people who invited us. He and his partner, Susan, invited us to the greater Toronto area. Uh, one thing that we found when we went on a tour of the Great Lakes was that almost no one is thinking bioregionally. And not that they have the word or they don't have the word, they don't have the perspective. Almost no one is thinking in terms of landscapes. But everywhere that I gave a talk, when I talked about landscapes, it was an epiphany for people. It just opened their minds to believe this was possible. And at the same time, um, most of our institutions are not set up to organize themselves around landscapes. And even the organizations that do, like when we were in, in the greater Toronto area, there's the, there are the conservation authorities of Ontario, which Brian could speak about more if you wanted to. And they operate at the scale of like watersheds or conservation areas for reforestation, um, that they are not very well structured with the rest of the economy. And so um, what I found was a hunger and an eagerness to learn more about this perspective, that it was new to most people, that it was deeply empowering. It showed them a holistic way to, you know, something that could actually work, something that could actually work, and that mostly they have no idea how to do it. And I don't know, I'd ask uh, Brian if you'd like to just share anything from your perspective, because Brian and his partner Susan have a lot of experience with this too. One thing that Joe just, just touched on briefly, but uh, you can review his book, The Design Pathway for Regenerating Earth, is that if we can get enough bioregions across the planet uh, focused on regenerating their bioregion, and using bioregional learning centers as a focal point for that work, uh, as, along with some other pieces, that working together, we can see that the work that we do on our little piece of land um, connected to work across the bioregion on restoration and regeneration, and then connecting that to a planetary network of bioregions, that you see your part scale linked to uh, planetary regeneration, which brings more meaning and purpose to your work and uh, can help um, catalyze activity and, and energy and, and innovation. When Joe spoke at um, about a dozen different talks he gave to different audiences in the greater Tukaranto Bay region, as Joe said, people resonated with the message. They, that makes sense to people. It gives them some hope that there is a way that we can all work together and regenerate the planet. Yeah, and we're gonna be doing more trips like this. Uh, uh, on May 19th, we're flying to Denver, and then we're gonna to go to some of the headwaters of the Colorado River on the Western slope of the Rockies. And we're gonna gather gift offerings from the headwaters and bring them to the Sea of Cortez. We're basically going to ask the ask forgiveness to the Sea of Cortez for the harm caused by everything in the basin, in the river system of the Colorado. And um, and we're going to invite anyone who would like us to to give a talk, to um, to just talk about this perspective, this way of being, and help to organize them. And yes, Albert, we should hang out when we come down. <laughs> um, around what date are you going to be? around the Gulf of California. Um, um, are you going to be? Uh, we will be there around the end of May. I don't know the exact dates. We're going to arrive in Denver on, on May 19th. Mm -hmm. So we'll start the trip probably on May 21st. 
Uh, so a week, two weeks later, something like that. And do you know in which part of the Sea of Cortez are you going to reach it? Well, we want to follow the, the Colorado River. So we'll follow the river to where it enters in the northern part of the Gulf. Uh, okay. but, uh, but if you and know of people we should meet, we should, uh, we should go meet with whoever, whoever would be good for us to meet. Okay, um, I don't know the people of this Desert Institute on San Luis Rio Colorado or in Mexicali, but they have, um, they are the ones who have this riparian wetland system, which has been recovered to a point where beavers have returned. Mm. But that might be a good starting point, that point of the delta. Yeah, I'd love to meet with them. I know people doing similar work in the, the Gunnison River Valley and the Roaring Fork River Valley and up in the mountains in Colorado. Um, and I know of some projects in Southern California. I think the, the opportunity, what we, the story that we will tell on that trip is the story of regenerating the entire Colorado River. Basically, yeah. We need to dream it before we can do it. And very few people are, are, have the courage to dream. We want to help give people the courage to dream. Yeah, it is a complex vision. Um, we yes. are talking about two countries. Yes, and uh, several major rivers and several different kinds of, of landscape. And some of the most um, contentious conflicts about water anywhere on earth. <laughs> like California taking the water that needs to go to Mexico. It's, it's, it's a big problem. <laughs> yeah, although Mexico is not necessarily completely a victim. Um, there is many um, yes. relationships. Mm. So. Yeah, I said, uh, well, just um, even like, digging into the the local region that I live in right and like seeing how many different there's so many different groups that are trying different things and like this practice of like working towards a bigger vision I feel like we just have limited practice or like limited capacity for right like holding all the complexity of like what does it mean to like really align ourselves into like one motion one dream together um and so, yeah, it, there's, a, there's more energy here, like even actually next weekend, there's like some beautiful gathering that's attempting to, to bring some of this energy to life more around here. Um, but yeah, I just find this like capacity to, to think at these different scales and then like know how to show up like day to day versus over like the longer period. So it's like absolutely a, a learning journey that, um, I see people on and like, I feel collectively like we're moving towards. And so it's, it's encouraging, but yeah, it's also like, okay, like let's, you know, find the exponential curves because there's so much to learn in such a short amount of time. Yeah, I can give an example of uh, where the learning is happening that Eileen can probably relate to. Because we were, we were in the, the front range of Colorado a couple of months ago, and we met with people from the dryland agroecology Research Institute and from United Ecology, which are two groups that do a lot of great work in the Denver Boulder area. And when we talked to them, their perspective as practitioners of landscape restoration, their mindset was completely resonant with what we were talking about. But their capacity and their practice was a whole, was a very different thing. So I'll use United Ecology as an example. These, they, they teach a lot of peop people permaculture and they do really good dry land restoration work, which is something that the Denver Boulder area, which gets almost no rain <laughs> and trees grow really slowly, is very, very important to manage the water well. But the reason that they're able to do this is because billionaires buy hobby ranches and can afford to pay them $200,000 to do landscaping. And that's how they can do this work. And then that enables them to be able to subsidize the cost of their permaculture training that they do to teach other people. So there's this weird way that 
people like them that are really completely aligned. They're so entrenched in the problems of the system and they know it. You know, I'm not criticizing them. They know it themselves. But to go from, you know, we are an organization that makes its money because billionaires hire us to do this work. And we try to do social good when we can on the side. And of course, it's very expensive to live in a place like Boulder. Just exemplifies the problem that we need a very different way of cooperating to enable us to consistently work at the landscape scale. And that it'll take time to build up that capacity. And that we'll mostly be very frustrated <laughs> during the time between now and then. Uh, the more that we see the vision, the more frustrating it is that we're not living the vision. And that's exactly the motivation to keep working to make it happen. So I know that we only have five minutes left before the break for the conference. I just wanna ask if there are any more questions or comments before we close, just to give space for it. Hmm. Mariana Posible. <laughs> um, I like that half of us here are Spanish speakers. This is great, more than half. Sweet. <laughs> um, well, maybe just to, to bring us to a close today, um, I wanted to name that when I first learned about bioregional learning centers as a concept in 2019, I had already learned about the Ecoversity Alliance. And my first thought was, let's help every Ecoversity become a bioregional learning center, because in many ways they already are but just help, the, help create a shared understanding of it so that it becomes more complete and more consistent from one place to another. That that is an existing network that could do this. I started thinking of other networks like the Global Eco Village Network, Transition Towns, you know, and then you could think there are more and more places that, that could do this as a network. And I ended up just stopping. Think, I don't think that way anymore. Now what I do is I look for, well, no, I don't even look. I am like a lighthouse that sends light out and it helps the ships find their way to shore. The reason that I know Brian is because Brian and Susan saw the signal of what we were doing and they invited us to Ontario for a bioregional activation. And so now what we're doing is making it visible what we, are, what we want to do and then different landscapes will invite us. And when they invite us, we help them build their own local capacity to do this work. And our vision is very much to create a planetary network of regenerative bioregions, where each one can have, as Brian said, can have its own bioregional learning center. And that we learn how to do this in the same way the Ecoversity Alliance works, by having learning exchanges, having a conference, a gathering, a summit, different ways of bringing this learning together and building the capacity to hold all of the complexity that's involved because this is incredibly complex work. But it's also the work that's needed. <laughs> There's no way to simplify it. If we simplify it, we, we don't do it. We don't do what's needed. So we have to get really comfortable dealing with the complexity. And unfortunately, the biggest complexity of all is human trauma and conflict. It's very, very difficult. But if we can, if we can make it uh, more visible, where are the places on earth that are doing this? What are the, the conceptual models and the frameworks to begin doing this? And then to create learning exchanges between those places. So two months ago, we opened the design school for regenerating earth as a place to do this. And I know some of you, Brian, Jonas, and Albert are in the design school. And we're, we're learning what the design school is together. Very, very early. It's been two months, very new. But we're certainly not the only ones who are trying to do this. So how do we find each other is a, a really big question, a good question. How do we keep finding each other? And so I hope we can find each other through the reimagination, a reimagine education conference and through our social networks as we know about what each of us is doing um, and the calling to the larger landscape, such as to see the, the Green River 
and the Colorado River and other rivers all part of the same system, or to see Lake Ontario as part of the Great Lakes, to see these larger connections that um, are already organized by the, by the planet, but that we as humans don't know how to organize ourselves around. So that's what I'd love to say. Thank you for being here with me during this hour for the time. Nice to see some old friends and looking forward to more. Yeah. Thank you, Joe. I think we all share this like gratitude and celebration of the way that you're leading, showing up in life. Um, yeah. And just like holding space for these dialogues. They are absolutely important and yeah, keep finding the others. <laughs> yeah. Muchas gracias por los que no hablan inglés muy bien. <laughs> sí. Gracias, Andrea. And thank you, everyone. Yeah. Oh. Better inhabitants of our yes. ecology.